Good morning. Thanks for joining us today um, for our, uh, excuse me, for our webinar on Bobcats. I'm Melissa Yabel with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And um, before we get started, I just want to let you know some of the awesome webinars that we have lined up this month for you. Um, I will put the link in the Q&A box, but um, we have a virtual programming web page with all of our webinars listed there. Um, next week on the 23rd at 10 a.m., we will be talking about the legacy of the Civilian Conservation Corps and some awesome um, African-American history related to the CCC to celebrate Black History Month. So please join us then. Um, also on the 24th at 10 a.m. again, we will have a maple syrup production demonstration with our friends from Houston Woods State Park. And um, then we have a whole bunch of webinars lined up for March. We'll be celebrating Women's History Month with, an, with another She's a Force of Nature series and, um, and a bunch of fun webinars from our friends at the Division of Parks and Watercraft. So I just want to point out the Q&A box. If you have any questions today, please utilize it. We will do our best to get to all of them. I know this is a super popular topic, so um, so hopefully we'll be able to answer all of your questions. We will absolutely do our best. Helping me today with questions is um, Jenna Winters. Uh, Jenna is, there she is. Hi, Jenna. Hi. And I also have Cindy Orth um, up from Northeast Ohio. And then our presenter today, I have Rochelle. So Rochelle, I will let you take it away. All right. Welcome everyone. My name is Rochelle and I am a park naturalist over at Wingfoot Lake State Park and Portage Lake State Park, so up in Northeast Ohio. And today we're going to dive into bobcats. So what we're going to go over is we're going to go over the biology, the difference between the Canadian lynx and the bobcat, the history in our state, and the research that's being done. But first I want to dive into cats in general. So they are a a member of the mammalia, which means they are mammals. So they have hair and they nurse their young. And if we break it down even further, they're inside the family Philidae or feline. And there are currently 36 uh, cat species in the world. And out of those 36, six can be found in North America. And only one of those is found in Ohio, the bobcat. And then we're gonna look into like the characteristics of cats themselves in general. So we're going to look at the eyesight, the claws, the size difference in males and females, the shape of the face, their tongue, and their tracks. So right here we can see a bobcat and those golden eyes just stand out. They have awesome sight. Um, they have specially adapted lenses on the retina that help them hunt at night so they're nocturnal. And if you ever see a cat caught in headlights or if you're out walking and you catch a cat with your flashlight, you see those glowing eyes come back. And that's what allows them to catch all the light at night to help them hunt. Another cool thing about cats is they have those retractable claws. So unlike their dog friends uh, where the claws are constantly out, the cats have the capability of retracting or drawing in their claw. And the picture on top actually shows how that claw will move backwards. So that piece of bone will actually come back to the other bone, allowing them to put their claws in. And this is very important when it comes to hunting um, and being stealthy. So when we think of cats, um, we like to compare sizes. So in the cat world, the males are always going to be larger than the females. Um, so the females are going to be smaller. Um, this is more like dominance and power. Now let's look at that face. Um, so if, if you ever looked at a cat compared to a dog, you'll notice that their, their shape of the face is more round, whereas a, a dog is more slender. And then if we look at their nose, so a dog has that really long nose, that really long tongue inside, whereas the cat kind of looks like it's smushed. And we can actually think of this as a way of, dogs have an amazing scent, so they have more room for collecting scents. Whereas the cat, they don't have like a really great sense of smell. I mean, they can still smell things, but it's not as strong as the canines. So that's why we use canines 
in the world of like searching for drugs and bombs and things like that. Oh, my favorite part is this tongue. I don't know if anybody has ever had a cat lick them. It feels like sandpaper. It's like really rough. Um, it kind of doesn't feel great. And I always wondered why, why is it that way? And these tongues are specially adapted. So in that picture of the cat right there, you can see the, the close up of that tongue and it looks like it has little teeth on it. And now these aren't necessarily teeth. These are a special type of um, keratin, which is the same thing as our fingernails. And they're actually little hollow cone shaped uh, features on their tongue. And this allows them to hold extra moisture in their tongue. So when they're cleaning themselves, they groom themselves all the time. Cats are very clean animals. Um, those papillae will actually allow them to put more substance on their fur. And we're actually, scientists look at animals for a lot of influencing on lots of things. So we looked at the dragonfly for the influence of helicopters. We've looked at seed dispersal mechanisms with uh, hitchhiker seeds with little bristles and how they attach to create uh, Velcro. Um, we've actually looked into the tongues of cats to see if we can mimic something from them. And we have special hairbrushes out there nowadays. I know my daughter has one. It's really neat. It mimics the cat tongue, not the look with the cone shape, um, but it's hollow bristles and it gives when you pull it through the hair. And actually it's more um, useful when it comes to tangles. So when the cat's tongue, when they're grooming themselves, they're also um, combing their hair and aligning it to make it like smooth. But we've also looked at it as a way of helping our veterinarians, uh, the doctors of the animals, uh, when it comes to applying medication to animals. That cat tongue can actually put more medicine on their designated spot than you just dabbing it with your finger. So they've actually created a way of using the cat's tongue replica brushes to, for an application of medication. So that's really neat that we can learn so much from animals. Um, one of my favorite parts is tracks. I love tracks. And if we look here on the left side, we have our canine or our dogs. And on the right side, we have our feline, the cat. And there are several different clues that can tell us if it's either a dog or a cat. And the number one sign is at that top left picture is the marks of the cloth. So if you're gonna see little dots above the toe pads, that is going to most likely be your canine. Whereas the cat over on the right does not show any claw marks. Like I said, they have those retractable claws which allow them for stealth and sneaking around and getting places without being heard. Also, if you look, there's a negative space. And this negative space is just that white spot in between the toe pads and the heel pad. And that negative space creates a shape. In the dog world, we like to call it an X. And as you can see in the middle picture on the left, I drew an X right there. So if you can form an X nicely in there, it's most likely going to be your canine. Whereas the cat on the other side, uh, remember C is for cat, you can actually do a C shape in that negative space. And then if you get into it more in depth, you can look at that heel pad. So that very last bottom pad there. And in a dog, the, the, the heel pad, the top pad only has one lobe, like one little mountain and two at the bottom. So it's gonna form a nice little V right there. Whereas our feline is going to have two lobes on top and three on the bottom. So it looks like an F. So those are neat little things to look at when you're out there walking, especially right now with the snow. Um, now, mind you, there are other critters out there walking about, but if you come across one, and you might think that it's a bobcat. Just remember, if it can, you can form a C around that heel lobe, it most likely is going to be a bobcat. So now that we know a little bit about the feline world, now we're going to dive deeper into our bobcats, the lynx rufus. So we're going to look at their size, the lifespan, the reproduction, their appearance, the range and habitat that they like to habit, and their diet. So a lot of people think that they see bobcats. Um, most of the time it's going to be a house cat. 
bobcats are pretty pretty big animals. Uh, they can weigh between 11 and 30 pounds, and their length from face to tail is around 26 to 41 inches long. And if you were to measure it from the shoulder down, it's going to be 12 to 24 inches. So that's twice the size of an average cat, although I have seen some really big cats out there. Um, another telltale sign is the tail. So make sure you look at that tail to see if it does, in fact, have a, a long tail or a short bob tail. Now, bob cats, they can get quite old. Um, so they can, in the wild, they can get up to 12 years of age, um, 10 to 12 on average. But like anything, if we have them in captivity, they're going to live longer. They have less threats. They get males brought to them every single day. So they don't have a taxing life. So they're going to live a lot longer in captivity. So around 20 to 25 years. All right, my favorite, those little kittens. Um, so reproduction. So normally mating season is going to occur between December and May. She's going to find lots of boyfriends and partners out there. So they're not monogamous, neither females nor males. They will partner up with just about as many cats that come into their territory. Now, that being said, the female is going to be the only one that's going to raise these kittens once they're born. And typically, after they have mated, within 60 days, she's going to have that little litter of kittens. And it's usually between one to six, but on average, it's around three. So she usually will find like a nice little den site, um, either rock outcroppings, down logs. Um, if you have a forest that was timbered and there's brushed up piles of brush, she'll go underneath them. She doesn't use the same den every single time. So if she feels threatened, she's going to move them. Um, even if you were to go out and find one right now, if you put too much presence on her, she's going to move those kittens. She doesn't want anything to happen to them. Uh, it's her number one goal in life is to reproduce. And so she'll do anything she can to protect those kittens. Uh, that being said, I know some places down south in our state, they've been known to go underneath sheds. So it's wherever they can find a nice little hidden, tucked away place that she's going to go ahead and raise her kids there. Now, within the first two months of life, um, being a mammal, they are dependent on the mother's milk. But after that, they will start eating solid food. So the mom will start bringing them back food to eat. And a cool thing about the kittens is within three to 11 days, they'll open their eyes. So it's, it's really fast development with the cat world. And these kids will actually stay with her up to a year, um, depending. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to rely on her for food, um, but they're going to stick around a little bit. And their territories might interlap a little tiny bit, but they're going to be self-sufficient within a year. So that appearance, again, they're named Bobcat. So you can see in that little circle picture, they have that short little stumpy bobbed tail. And this tail will help us distinguish them from the Canadian lynx and also modern house cats. Although I've seen some cats out there with bobbed tails. Um, so you gotta get a watch, you gotta judge their size, um, and also look at the, the cat as a whole. So if you look at the ears, they have these awesome little ear spots, and these are very important. Uh, not only um, are they important to distinguish from other household cats, but if you're out there as a wild cat in the woods, you want to make sure that nobody's going to come after you. Uh, they don't have a lot of predation on them, so they don't have to worry a lot, but it's always good to make sure that your component knows that you might be looking at them. So if you come across a bobcat from behind, it looks like you're looking at them face on. So it's like they see you, even though they don't. Or as I like to call it, they have mom eyes. They have eyes in the back of their head. Um, they also have those cool little ear tufts at the uh, top of their ears. And that's just little extended hair tufts. Um, they kind of help aid in some uh, sound detection. Um, they also have these amazing whiskers all over their face. I don't know if anybody's got to see a house cat up close. They have lots of whiskers everywhere. And whiskers are very important to a cat. They help them sense at night. So when they're walking through the brush, they can actually feel things 
with those whiskers, just like a, a catfish too. They have those awesome whiskers that help them find things uh, on the bottom of the water floor. And then bug has also have beards or cheek ruffs. And these cheek ruffs, um, they're important when we look at the Canadian lynx compared to the bobcat to differentiate the two. They have wide padded paws. Um, again, stealth is very important for a cat. They are pouncers and they are stealthy. So they like to pounce on their victim. So they need to be quiet when they're stalking them. And then they have long legs. And these long legs help out not only with running, which they can do fast little bursts of speeds. They're not like a cheetah where they run super, super fast um, for long periods. It's just little microbursts is what they do, but these long legs help them climb. So they're excellent climbers and climbing helps um, get away from predations, um, help hide from humans if we're in the woods and they're scared. Um, and also to just kind of like find a spot to sleep in a tree. So the range, like I said earlier, uh, bobcats are found in North America. Their evolution journey. Um, so they came originally from like the Africa and area and their ancestors traveled up north and they became the Eurasian lynx. And later, about 2.5 million years ago, they actually traveled even north, more farther north. And that's how we got the bobcats today. And when they traveled further north, they broke off into two little branches. So we have the Canadian lynx and then we have the bobcat. Uh, so that's really neat to see how they journeyed up our way. Uh, their home range is usually 16 square miles um, for males and six square miles for females. So the females have a smaller territory, but the male is going to have a larger one. And he's going to have several females in his area. So just to make sure that he has the most chance of spreading his genes throughout the area. So their habitat. So our bobcats love young forest. So here's a picture of Jefferson Lake State Park where um, Cindy and I have actually worked a, quite a bit on the trails down there. And we've seen multiple signs of bobcats from tracks to even hearing one. We got to witness a mother cat doing her little call to her kits. So it's really nice down there to uh, get to see and hear them. Um, up here in Northeast Ohio, we don't have as much as our Southern counterparts. So when we see bobcats, we get so excited and tickled pink when we see them. Um, they can also be found in wetlands. Um, and wetlands are a very unique um, habitat system their diversity is super large. So we're looking at animals from like the muskrat, the beaver, waterfowl, to um, mice, um, the outsource, like the outer area where it starts to dry up some more. Um, that's where they're usually found, the bobcats. Um, that's where the populations of rabbits, squirrels, raccoons, and possums, all that other creatures are starting to blossom. So they love those type of areas, thick areas where they can hide. They have that awesome camouflage pattern, which we'll talk about. Um, so getting into their diet, um, bobcats are carnivores and they're opportunistic. So if they can catch it, they're going to eat it. Um, so in Ohio, with the studies that we have done, we've noticed that the number one animal that we find in their stomachs when we discover roadkill and ex examine it is rabbit. There's lots of rabbit parts inside of them. But they'll also eat mice, squirrels, birds, even the deer, insects, if you're hungry, you're hungry, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Now with this being said, they're not going to annihilate a population. Um, bobcats are very unique as they are a keystone species, so they help regulate species. Uh, with that being said, they know when to not overexert their their prey. So if they notice the numbers are going down, they're going to move elsewhere. They're going to find more food. Um, so we have a lot of concerns like, oh no, they're going to kill all the deer population. 
the deer population is actually very healthy in Ohio. We have wonderful reports that come in from our archers that are actually saying that they have seen more deer, um, which is really good. Um, so we got to remember that these cats are just going to help us out with population control and keeping every species in check. If you have too many rabbits and squirrels running around, um, the ecosystem is going to change quite a bit. Uh, the same thing with deer. If we have a lot of deer running around, they're going to overgraze on plant species, so our diversity in plants are going to go down, and it's just overall it's bad for that species of animal. There, there's less food, there's more competition, and that's when disease and famine start spreading around. So with keystone species, they help regulate and keep everybody intact. So, and with that being said, bobcats originally were in Ohio, so they were supposed to be here. So now let's compare the two cousins, the Canadian lynx and the bobcat. So the bobcat is on the left and the Canadian lynx is on the right. And if you look just right off the bat, you can see some major differences when it looks and comes to comparison in their looks. That bobcat has more of a broken up coat. So it has white and black spots and gray and tan and red appearance to it. Where if you look at that Canadian lynx, I like to compare it to kind of like a deer. It's a solid color throughout. It has just a nice solid look with it, not different spots or anything like that. Another thing is those ears. If we look at the ears, the Canadian lynx has a lot of hair in that hair tuft. It's a more distinct, like you can't miss it. Where with the bobcat, if you're looking, you might be able to see a little bit of the tuft, but for the most part, like if you see a lot, um, it's going to be that Canadian lynx. Now here in Ohio, we do not have Canadian lynx. Those are a northern species, so they like it where it's all kind of cold and snowy. So Canada, Alaska type areas. Um, with that being said, they're also taller than the bobcats and they have bigger feet. So they have that snowshoe foot appearance, which helps them in their, their range. Now this Bobcats and Canadian lynx do have populations that overlap in our northern states to the west. So like in Montana, you might be able to find both of them. Um, but for the most part, the Canadian lynx is going to stay up high. And his or their main food source is the snowshoe hare. So they're very dependent on that snowshoe hare bunny. And if we look at their skeleton system as a whole, the snowshoe and the Canadian lynx have a similar structure. So it's pretty unique that that's going to be its critter of choice to eat. Whereas the bobcat is known to eat snowshoe hares, but for the most part, they're going after squirrels and chunks and rabbits and other things like that. Um, now, if we look at their tails, um, this is another clue that I was talking about is that tail that helps get them away. A bobcat is going to have that little white spot at the end. So it's going to have the brown, then the black little tip, but on the very end of it, it's going to have white. Whereas the lynx, the Canadian lynx, it's all a solid black. So some of the threats. So a number one threat to our bobcats are going to be owls, eagles, hawks, coyotes, vehicles, parasites, and diseases. So when a bobcat is smaller, um, they're preyed upon by our eagles and our hawks and our owls. And coyotes will prey on larger bobcats, but for the most part, they're not going to go after them too, too much. Like I said earlier, bobcats don't really have to worry about a lot of mammals. Um, it's mostly vehicles that are their uh, main worry within the state. Um, the state of Ohio is actually um, number 10 in rank of like the most populated uh, high trafficked state in Ohio or traffic system in the United States. So we have lots of roadways that break up habitats. So when they're moving about, they're most likely going to encounter a vehicle. So we have some folklore about bobcats. Um, they have been found in 
uh, Native American caves dating back to the late BC times. Um, and many tribes had different views on bobcats. Some found them to be a magical, mystical creature that if you were able to see one, that you would have good luck. Where others viewed them as horrible, bad creatures, uh, a sign that you were going to have bad luck. Um, they sometimes called people bobcats because they were sneaky in their ways. So it, it just depended on where you were from. Um, like I said, uh, bobcats are important. They're a keystone species. They help keep things in check. Um, so they they help the possums, the raccoons, groundhogs, and other small animals stay in a healthy number so that way their uh, species survives. And they will go after larger animals. They are known to go after deer, uh, adult deer, and they're known to go after livestock as well. Um, it's not a big worry just yet in our state. I mean, there have been predation from bobcats on chickens. Uh, they love chickens, but who doesn't like chickens? I mean, everybody likes chicken, like fox love it, weasels, mink. So all the animals like that. It's a good source of protein, so they're gonna go after your chickens. So if you do have chickens, just make sure that they're locked up and uh, put away at night. And for the most part, when it comes to like the larger livestock, it's just usually our, our sick, and young. So if you have, if it's calving season, they might go after that if they can't find other food. So predation. Why is it important? And what have we learned from Yellowstone National Park? So again, a lot of people get feared from, fearful of having our major predators in our state, such as our bobcats and coyotes. Um, but if we were to take those keystone species out, we would have the same situation at Yellowstone. When the wolves were removed from Yellowstone, the game went crazy. So our deer and elk populations just ballooned. They blossomed. There was, the herds got large. But when that happens, they deplete their food source. And with depletion of food source, the herd's going to come into micro little um, spots, habitats. And with that being said, that's when we get a lot of our diseases that are going to spread throughout the herd and wipe it out. So our predators will help keep the system in check. So they will help keep that number low enough that it will be sustainable, but large enough that it's not going to wipe the whole species out. So the competitors. So they have the coyotes to compete with and the fox. Now, most of the time, they're all going to get along just fine. There's enough food out there for them all. But if a coyote fears that their area is getting over predation, they will actually go after the bobcats to eliminate them to ensure that they have food. Whereas the fox, on the other hand, the, that shy little critter right there, he, he wants nothing to do with the bobcat. So for the most part, you're not going to find fox with the bobcat. They might overlap a little tiny bit, but he's going to stay away from that bobcat because that bobcat's big enough to take him down. So if we look at the bobcats in our state, we, we want to see what happened to them. Uh, why did their population become null in our state? And there's two reasons behind this. One is loss of habitat, and the second is being overhunted or trapped. So back in the earlier days, we didn't have our wonderful wildlife regulations that we have nowadays. So it was a free for all. So people went out and if they wanted to kill the animal, they killed the animal. Um, we've had several species in our state wiped out completely from the turkey, the beaver, um, the bobcat, and wolves and uh, mountain lions. But also when we came to Ohio, we decided that this is a great land um, and we wanted to take full use of it. So we timbered it and now we farm. So with that removal of the habitat, we wiped out the brushy area for them to hide and be able to survive and we pushed them out of our state. So in the mid 1850s is when we completely pushed them out. They, um, we didn't have that many sightings of bobcats. 
we extirpated them in the 18, mid 1800s. Um, they were one of the first species listed as an endangered species in the state of Ohio in 1974. And between 1970 and 2000, the sightings increased. We didn't have a lot like we used to. We might have like five a year. Um, and unlike the turkey, bobcats weren't reintroduced. So we didn't bring them back. Um, so our population that we have now have actually migrated from other states into our state. And with the studies that we've completed with wildlife that wildlife has done with universities is that they have actually determined that there are two different gene pools. Um, so we have the southern gene pool and then the southeastern gene pool. And if we look at them, um, we can see that the southeastern population is self-sufficient. Yeah, self and what that means is the reproduction, oh my goodness, reproducing at a rate that we don't have to have other bobcats from other states coming into our area. Their, their populations is growing rapidly Whereas the southern state or the southern part of our state, that population, they are reproducing, but a lot of them are coming from other states. So they're migrating into our state. And like I said, the Division of Wildlife is doing a research, um, continuous research right now on the, um, the bobcats. So just because you're seeing a lot of the bobcats doesn't mean that we don't want to know about it. And I know Alyssa is going to add a, a site that you can um, report your sightings. Um, like I said, we love getting all the information that we can to track this. This will help us with uh, regulations on bobcats in the future, just like our deer regulations that we do. So when it comes to reporting, there are two types of reporting that we look at. We look at the verified recordings, which is a trail camera picture, um, road kill, confirm the reporting from uh, personnel within the division. And then we have unverified. So that's when like, oh my goodness, I just saw a bobcat run across the road or there's a bobcat in my yard, but you don't have a picture to back it up. Both are very important. Uh, we look at both of them and we map it out. And this allows us to keep track of our population. Um, with that being said, there in the future, there could be a trapping season for these. Um, uh, just like everything else, like deer hunting and uh, raccoon and coyote and all that fun stuff, we like to regulate our species. So with the Division of Wildlife, they set regulations to help ensure that that population is going to remain healthy. So if you have any questions, reach out to your district, uh, wildlife district office, and I'm sure they can help you out with that. So if we dive into the research, um, Ohio University right now is doing an ongoing uh, study on bobcats. Now they don't actually go out and capture the cats, but they use other different types of ways of getting uh, information from them, such as hair snares, which is a way just to collect some hair off of a, off of a cat um, that's walking by and they can collect that hair and get DNA from it. So there's different ways that they do this. Um, as you can see there, it's pretty simple of just wrapping barbed wire around a tree, putting a scent on that tree that makes that cat come up and smell it. Um, they're territorial, so they're gonna rub and mark it to make it the, that place is theirs. So this allows them to collect it that way. Other places use what kind of looks like a board with nails sticking out of it. Um, it looks rough, but honestly, like when cats rub against things, they know how much pressure to put against it. So they're not going to be like gouging themselves with nails or the barbed wire part per se. But this is just another way of collecting more hair to do studies. And these studies will help determine the health of the bobcat population in Ohio. Um, so we can test their genes. Like we, like I said, we have two different gene pools. We can see where they're at in the states. Um, and then also like the impact of roads and bobcat population. Like I said, um, Ohio's 10th largest highway network system and the fourth uh, largest interstate system in the United States. So we have a lot of cars out there. So with that being said, yes, it is like the number one cause of the death of the bobcat, but it also helps us collect uh, the bodies and to examine them to see what they're, they're eating and if there's any disease going on. 
So the Ohio State University um, also did a, a research uh, project on it. And this is Darcy Doreen Myers. And she wrote a thesis pro or paper that involved um, the wildlife's Dr. Susan Prang um, studies. And they determined, tried to determine like a nice size of the population that we have in our state. And with this, they actually had 718 uh, trap nights. And with that being said, they used trail cameras um, and they set up that and um, they recorded pictures of areas that were hot spots. They, they took the sightings that were reported to wildlife and they went out and they established uh, web cam or trail cams to document the creatures. And with that, they had over 4,000 photos taken and 23 animal species, species, which is really cool. And out of that, 91 of them were bobcats. So that was a really good um, uh, data source to build a fund foundation for our bobcat population in the state. All right. Got any questions there, Melissa? Rochelle, we have a ton of questions. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, okay, so let me, we've answered a lot of them in the chat that we could, but let me see, is there, is it true that male bobcats travel far to breed with other bobcats outside of their territory? Yes, it is. Um, I know a research in Connecticut actually found that a male bobcat traveled like 30 miles before. Um, they're very smart animals. They will actually use the roadways corridors as their own little highway systems. So the cat that they tracked actually walked up the interstate, hung out for a couple of days, like a week probably, and then came back down to its home area. Now in Ohio, they use like riverways. So the sides of rivers and creeks Creek beds. Um, that's their highways. And also we have an amazing trail system in the state. So I always call them the, the animal highways of the woods. So yeah, a bobcat will travel, travel quite a distance. Okay. And um, we had another question about kind of about migration. Um, with the Ohio River being a large part of our border, how do they, how do they cross? Um, they actually swim. They will swim. And then right now, with it being uh, kind of colder, they don't have much of a distance to jump across. They can jump over like 10 feet in, if necessary in areas. Um, but just like our deer population, they'll swim too. So all of our animals can swim. Um, with the Ohio River itself up here by Northeast Ohio, where it starts in my neck of the woods, it's above us that they cross over from up there. But yeah, they're swimmers. There's islands out there. The, the river kind of comes and goes. It's not a consistent distance throughout. It does narrow and then widen in areas. Okay. And besides the um, besides the wildlife reporting form that I shared the link in the chat there, are there specific or preferred tags that um, ODNR uses for iNaturalist? And I know that you use iNaturalist or Shell. Um, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this or not. Yeah. Um, so the wonderful thing about iNaturalist is that scientists have the ability to go in and we can pull data. So I know for a fact that we have a dragonfly database that if you report a dragonfly, it's going to be pulled by whoever is in that area or your area. So I would imagine if you report a bobcat sighting in that area, wildlife or actually the universities will have the ability to pull just the, the search bobcat and it will pull from the whole state and then they can pinpoint where it's at. And we've had a lot of questions about the population of bobcats in Ohio. Do you know how many there are? Um, and then somebody also asked why are numbers in Ohio low if they don't have a lot of predators? Okay, so back in 2018, we had confirmed sightings of 391. And then in 2019, 461 confirmed sightings. So the population is going up. Um, even though predation is not an issue right now, they're still establishing um, the range. So not all cats are just gonna, like they don't flock in a herd per se, but they're just going to slowly trickle in. So the population is increasing, 
increasing. Like I said, so southeastern Ohio, they're booming. Um, if you go down there, the, the sightings are phenomenal. Like I know at Salt Fork, it's it's easy to see one. So yeah. Okay. Um, and we had Avery, age six, ask if bobcats like water. They do. Um, so it's really interesting. A lot of people think that cats don't like water. For the most part, majority of cats don't like water, but a lot of them do. Um, bobcats are one of those ones that do like water. They like the wetland area. They don't mind walking through water. I know my house cats, if it was raining outside, they wouldn't go out. For a bobcat, that's no worry. Um, the other day when I was down at Jefferson, I was actually following them walking through a stream. And um, I would personally rather walk through the snow, but the bobcat would rather walk through the water. So yeah, water is not an issue for them. <laughs> um, let's see. And uh, we've had a lot of questions about where in Ohio bobcats are. Um, they're mostly in southeast Ohio. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, they're, so they're in that area. So like I know like Noble and the surrounding areas, um, Jackson and Benton County is like those are our hot spots down there. Have there been sightings in Northwest Ohio? Um, our maps do have some sightings from 2011. So they do have sightings everywhere pretty much. Um, with that being said, there's not an established breeding going on in that area. So it's probably like a migrator walking through, passing by. Um, on that note, the whole United States can have um, bobcats, but in the state of Delaware, that's the only state that there's no breeding going on. And I like to compare that with our Western part of the state right now. So you could see them, but there's no breeding activity occurring. Gotcha. Um do people raise bobcats from a kitten and have them as a pet? <laughs> okay, so that brings a very dear thing to me right now. Um, leave wildlife in the wild. I know they're cute. I know you want to have it as a pet, um, but it's not good for the animal. So with that being said, as a naturalist, um, we actually have permits for all the animals that we have. Um, so if you want to or absolutely have to have one, which I'm all against, you'd have to go and get a permit for that. You just can't go to the wild, see a kitten, and take it home. That's highly illegal. Um, again, for the health of the animal, when you have it in captivity, there are so many things that can go wrong. Uh, I know for a fact with reptiles, not everybody does the UV, but um, UV light to give them that nutrition from the UV bulb. Um, the heat source is wrong. So with the bobcats, you're not going to get the, the nutrition that they need. These are an animal that eats raw critters. It's not cat food that you can buy at a store. So I highly recommend against it, and it is illegal in our state. Um, we had a question from Isaiah, who's age seven, and he asked, how do they mark their territory? Oh, awesome. So cats are very scent oriented, so they like to leave smells behind. Um, they have little areas on their head that will leave like an oil. Uh, the males will actually mark from their behinds where they spray pee on trees. Um, they actually leave scat piles as well. So they'll go and they'll poop somewhere. And that's a sign that, hey, this is my area, don't come in. And they'll actually make rounds every day just to ensure that their, their territory is well marked. Because sometimes that visitor will come in and he'll sneak in there and he'll pee. But they want to make sure that, the, hey, this is mine. So we'll go back through and they'll pee over top of it. Okay. And are they likely to attack humans? Okay. So bobcats are very shy. All right. So for the most part, they're, you're not going to see them unless they want you to see them. And when it comes to attacking people, it's most likely not going to happen unless you're promoting that. So if you're doing a rabbit in distress call constantly inside your blind or wherever you're hiding, if you're hunting, they might come up to you and because you're all in camouflage and you do a slight movement, they might take you as their prey and pounce on you then, but they're not just going to come out and attack a human. Okay. Um, we've had a lot of questions about a map of sightings for the state on our division of wildlife. Um, 
website. There is a map from, but it's from 2017. That's the latest map I'm aware of. Um, yeah. I'm going to put that in the q and I'm going to publish that link there for anybody that wants to check it out because we are getting a lot of questions about that. Um, Liv asks, how do you tell besides size if it's male or female? Ooh. Size is the main one, um, unless you can get close to them. Um, so if you find a roadkill, obviously you can check for uh, the genital parts. Um, but just walking around, it's, it's very hard in our animal world unless you have two to compare. And with that, like bobcats are solitary animals, so they're normally not going to be around each other unless it's breeding season or if she has kicks. So it's not really an easy way of determining the size and the sex. Okay, and Gabe, age eight, asks, what is the biggest thing recorded that bobcats have eaten? Mm. So I would have to say it's going to be like a white-tailed deer would be my guess, which is pretty awesome because like I said, they're twice the size of a, an average house cat and to take down a deer, that's pretty impressive. That is impressive. Um, I think that we answered most questions either um, through talking here or in the chat. Oh, oh, I see Jeff and Liam, age five. Um, why do bobcats climb trees? Well, it's just like us. They like to do it for fun. Um, but also it's a nice place to get away. So if there's a coyote in the area and they feel friends, or if we're walking along and they feel threatened, they're going to climb up that tree and they're going to literally stay up there and watch us walk by. So it's a, a safety and it's fun too. Okay, Jenna or Cindy, chime in if I'm missing any questions, but I think that we either answered them in text or um, or over, you know, through talking here. Um, so I think that is going to wrap things up today. Um, thank you all for your questions. We had a ton. You kept us busy. <laughs> and thank you, Rochelle, for your presentation today. Um, once again, if, if anybody has um, uh, wants to look at our other webinars, please go to our website. Um, I did put it in the Q&A, um, but you can find our virtual programming page on our website um, for all of the upcoming webinars that we have. And if you missed anything and you want to watch it back, we are recording this. We record all of our webinars that we do. So we have a great collection on our YouTube page. So if you just go to YouTube and search Ohio DNR, you will find all of the wonderful videos um, from all of our divisions there. But thank you um, for joining us and I hope you have a great day.